In a monolithic application or older distributed applications, we often use transactions that span over multiple external systems. Typical examples are transactions that include one or more databases or a database and a message broker. These transactions are called global or distributed transactions. They enable you to apply the asset principle to multiple systems. In this lecture, I will give a quick introduction to the general concept of a transaction. I expect that you are already familiar with that concept and therefore don't get into too many details. After that, I will explain the difference between a local and a global transaction, how both of them work, and why you need to avoid global transactions in a microservice architecture. We will also talk about dual rights, the problems they can cause, and the vital difference to eventual consistency. Transactions manage the changes that you perform in one or more systems. These can be databases, message broker, or any other kind of software system. The main goal of a transaction is to provide asset characteristics. That's an acronym that I will explain in more details on the next slide. These characteristics help you to ensure the consistency and validity of your data. To make it even better, all modern application stacks make managing transactions extremely easy by implementing the JTA specification. By default, they handle everything for you. They start the transaction before a client request gets processed, roll back the transaction if an error occurs, and commit it after the client request got processed. They also enable you to start a new transaction or exclude certain parts of your business logic from the transaction. I will get into more details about that in a few minutes. You can also implement your own transaction management. That is called bean managed transactions, and I recommend not to use it. Container managed transactions are easy to use, reliable, and flexible enough to adapt them to your business needs. I will therefore not get into any more details about bean managed transactions in this course. Transactions provide you asset characteristics. Asset is an acronym that stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Let's take a closer look at all four characteristics. Atomicity describes an all or nothing principle. Either all operations performed within the transaction get executed or none of them. That means if your transaction gets committed successfully, you can be sure that all operations got performed. It also enables you to abort a transaction and discard all operations that you already performed if an error occurs. The consistency characteristic ensures that your transaction takes a system from one logical consistent state to another logical consistent state. That means that either all operations were rolled back and the data was set back to a consistent state, or the changed data passes all consistency checks. In a relational database, that means that the modified data needs to pass all constraint checks, like foreign key or unique constraints, defined in your database. Isolation means that changes that you perform within a transaction are not visible to any other transactions until you commit them successfully. Durability ensures that your committed changes get persisted. And that is the ACID acronym. As you can see, a transaction that ensures these characteristics makes it very easy to keep your data valid and consistent. But asset transactions are not the only way to achieve that. A lot of modern applications rely on a concept called eventual consistency. While asset transactions ensure that your system is always in a consistent state, eventual consistency only ensures that it will be consistent at some point. That means that if you stop changing your data and wait for some time, all read operations will return the last updated value. That's a much weaker guarantee than an asset transaction provides. That makes scaling and high availability much easier. Eventual consistency doesn't require you to keep all involved systems in sync all the time. It's okay if one or more systems get updated asynchronously, which improves the scalability and robustness of your system. That makes eventual consistency especially popular in large, distributed applications. Several of the patterns that we will discuss in this course follow the eventual consistency principle. They, for example, replicate data asynchronously, so the data managed by each microservice is consistent. But if you change data that gets replicated to other services, some of these replicated data stores might not be updated when you perform the next read operation. Depending on your use case, this can be totally fine or a huge problem. It, for example, isn't a problem if the reviews in an online bookstore 
are updated in an eventually consistent way. When you look at a book, it doesn't really matter if you see 100 or 101 reviews, right? But that's not the case for the inventory when a customer places an order. You should be sure that you can fulfill the order before the customer pays for it. So you probably need an asset transaction or another way to ensure that you use the correct data when processing the order. After we talked about asset transactions and eventual consistency, we also need to talk about dual rights. As Gunnar Morling always says, friends don't let friends do dual rights. But why not? And what exactly is a dual right? A dual right are two write operations performed on two different external systems without a distributed transaction. This is the simplest way to update two external systems, but also the most dangerous one. As long as both write operations are successful, a dual write might seem like a great idea. It's easy and it scales great. But what happens if the second write operation fails? You already performed the first one and can cancel it. You might try to handle that by performing the inverse operation of your previous update. But that's often complicated and there's no guarantee that it works. The inverse operation might fail, or even worse, your application crashes before you can perform the inverse operation. There are lots of different scenarios in which a failed second write operation of a dual write resides in inconsistent data. In the best case, your support team can fix it before the inconsistent data gets used. But most often, you either need to keep the inconsistent data, or you need to roll back to the latest backup. I think we both agree that this is not something we want to explain to our manager or customers. And to make it absolutely clear, eventual consistency and dual rights are two completely different things. Eventual consistency guarantees you that at some point your data will be consistent in all systems. Dual rights don't guarantee you anything. If everything goes well, the data in all systems will be consistent. But if anything happens, you get inconsistent data and your job will be to find a way to fix that. Okay, let's get back to asset transactions. I think I made it clear that you either need eventual consistency or asset transactions to ensure the correctness and consistency of your data. Asset transactions provide a stronger guarantee and that's why we use them for local transactions. But global or distributed transactions are not a good fit for a microservice system. Let's take a look at both of them and explain why that is the case. As mentioned earlier, all major Java platforms provide you with an implementation of the Java Transaction API. And you should use container-managed transactions. By default, they get automatically started before your business code gets executed, and it gets automatically committed or rolled back after the execution of your code. If you implement a REST service, for example, the transaction gets started when the client calls the REST endpoint, and it gets committed or rolled back when the REST endpoint returns the response to the client. You can adjust that behavior by annotating your methods with a transactional. You can use this annotation in Spring, Spring Boot, Jakarta EE, and MicroProfile. Typical use cases in which you might want to do that is if you want to deactivate a transaction or start an additional transaction for a part of your business code. But before you do that, please make sure that you understand what that means for your read and write operations. This is out of the scope of this lecture, but you can find great explanation for that in your Spring, Jakarta EE, or MicroProfile documentation. Okay, let's compare local and global transactions. Similar to a monolithic application, microservices heavily rely on local transactions to ensure the correctness and consistency of their data. The only difference is that local transactions in a microservice tend to be shorter than local transactions in a monolith. That's simply because your microservice does less than a monolith. The main idea of a microservice is to only focus on one responsibility. As a result, tasks that the monolith handled in one local transaction might become the responsibility of multiple services. Each of them uses its own small local transaction. A local transaction is very efficient. You or your container start a transaction before you interact with your database. If all of your operations were successful, you commit the transaction. Otherwise, you roll it back. Pretty simple, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case for global or distributed transactions. They use a pattern called two-phase commit. This pattern describes a complex process that requires multiple steps. 
And that's the main reason why global transactions are slow and why you should avoid them in a microservice architecture. As you might have guessed from the name, the main difference between a local and a global transaction that uses the two-phase commit pattern is the commit operation. As soon as more than one system is involved, you can't just send a commit message to each of them. That would create the same problems as we discussed for dual writes. The two-phase commit avoids these problems by splitting the commit in two steps. The transaction coordinator first sends a prepare command to each involved system. The system then check if they could commit the transaction. If that's the case, they respond with prepared and the transaction coordinator sends a commit command to all systems. The transaction was successful and all changes get committed. If any of the systems doesn't answer the prepare command or responds with failed, the transaction coordinator sends an abort command to all systems. This rolls back all the changes performed within the transaction. As you can see, a two-phase commit is more complicated than the simple commit of a local transaction. But it gets even worse when you take a look at the systems that need to prepare and commit the transaction. After a system confirmed the prepare command, it needs to make sure that nothing will change until it receives the commit or abort command. The only way to do that is to lock all the information that you changed in the transaction. As long as this lock is active, no other transaction can use this information. These locks can become a bottleneck that slows down your system and should obviously be avoided.